So what's the story? Well, I've been thinking. Wouldn't it be cool if we were action heroes in our own movie and some bad guys were trying to blow us up, but we managed to escape? Is that a harp I'm hearing? Shush, here comes a clip. It's a climactic cinema cliche. Our heroes are trapped on a boat and a bomb's about to explode. To escape certain death, they take the plunge. And after a huge kaboom, resurface completely unharmed. So you're wondering whether diving underwater could help protect you from an injury in the case of an explosion. Exactly! Sounds like a blast. <laughs> the Mythbusters are no strangers to shockwaves, testing if they can cushion a fall. Wow, here comes the shockwave. Fuse metal and even make diamonds. But what actually causes one? A shockwave is created when the rapidly expanding gases inside an explosion travel faster than the speed of sound. And it's this shock front that causes a wave of destruction. But can you avoid imminent annihilation by leaping into water? Well, to find out, the Mythbusters are hunkering in the bunker for a proof of concept. So what's this tank all about? Well. Jamie and I wanted to build an experiment that allowed us to see the propagation of a shockwave in water versus air, i.e. in a high impedance fluid as opposed to a low impedance fluid. So, with a little bit of acrylic, a little number 16 acrylic glue, some caulk, and some 1032 button-headed and countersunk screws, I put together this bifurcated tank with a plan to fill this half with water and that half with dry ice fog, or air that we can visualize. We're gonna put a firecracker right up here in the center, explode it, and hopefully we'll be able to view that same shockwave in the two different media and see if there's a difference on the high-speed camera. And for that, Jamie's turn to string theory. These will hang in the water and move if a shockwave hits. With the tanks filled and a firecracker primed, stand by for mayhem in miniature. Everything's perfect. I saw the water move. Well, let's see how it looked on the high speed. But a closer look at the high speed reveals not much, actually. I think we need something bigger than this firecracker. I think we do. We're going to juice things up a bit. This little firecracker only has a few grains of flash powder in it. If you happen to hold on to this, it'd give you a nasty little burn and make your fingers numb. Officer Smith, I think we need something a little bigger. Can you hook us up? M80. That ought to do it. This thing has a few grams of flash powder in it. If you held on to it, your fingers are going away. It's going to give us enough of a shock wave to do the job. With shock waves, apparently, size matters. Cue the M80. Come on, baby. Wow! <laughs> that was loud. And interestingly, I saw the fog move, but not the water. Well, let's check it out on high speed. I didn't see much. Did you? I'm seeing the smoke move around. See that divot there? Remember, they're looking for proof that a shock wave behaves differently in water to air. But the shock waves aren't showing up on the close-up. So for a bigger boom, it's back to Officer Smith. The M1000. Ah, uh, more? About 100 times more. <laughs> Hopefully that should tie up Jamie's loose threads. Oh, it's getting close. Here it comes. Whoa! <laughs> I think we're going to have seen something. I think so. Oh, did that blow the door open? <laughs> There's water on the ceiling. <laughs> That's always a good sign. Yeah. A good sign, but once again, the high-speed replay has the same problem. There's no clear shot of the shockwave. It's reacting, but they seem to be reacting differently somehow. Well, they're not telling us what we want to see. I think we're going to have to concoct a different test if we're going to learn whether or not there's a difference between a shockwave in the water and a shockwave in the air. I think you're right. We're done here. Okay.